Well, good morning, church. It's me again. Um, my name is Debbie Johnson. For those of you who do not know me, please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 15, and follow along with me as I read. If you are using one of the blue Bibles, it is page number 1758. Verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Good morning, church. Good to be together here on site. And if you're in our Connection Cafe, good morning to you or those on live stream. Um, I have lost in Catan many, many, many times. I think I've won once. So it's true. <laughs> Last week, uh, right after the sermon, I received a really nice compliment from someone. They said, Pastor Jerry, you have beautiful feet. You see, last week, it was Jason, last week I had the privilege of sharing the gospel, talking about what it would mean to believe the gospel. And so it's true. Those who share the gospel have beautiful feet. We learn this in Romans 10, 15. Debbie just read this for us. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And where that was written, where Paul is quoting from, is Isaiah. In fact, he quotes from the Old Testament quite a bit. Isaiah uh, is a lot of that as well. 52, 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Isaiah is originally, uh, in his original context, is talking to the Jewish exiles those who have been sent away by God are now going to be able to return to their own uh, promised land, and they're excited about that. And the, the good news comes that the captives will be set free and able to return to their own country. Paul picks up on this theme, this idea of captivity, this idea of being set free, and he mentions that this applies to the good news of the gospel, not just for the Jews, but also for Gentiles, for anyone and everyone bringing the good news that spiritually lost people can be set free from their captivity to sin. Good news, proclaim it. This phrase, bringing good news, comes from a Greek word, euangelizo, which is where we get our English word evangelism or evangelize. And to evangelize means to share the good news to bring it, to announce it, to proclaim it from the mountaintops. Go tell it on the mountain. Or as we sang this morning, from the rooftops, proclaim this good news. And that's what each Christ follower is called to do. We are all part of that, proclaiming this good news. Bring it. Spiritually lost people will not hear this good news unless we tell them. Each one of us has been sent. Romans 10 talks about those who are sent. Each one of us has been sent to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors, to those at school, to those at work, whoever it might be in our sphere of influence. We've been sent to them as a spokesperson for Jesus Christ. You see, pastors... And paid professionals are not the only ones who can have beautiful feet. We're all intended to have beautiful feet. Be a great compliment for any one of us to be told that. So how about you? How are your feet looking these days? And could it be 
that all of us, including myself, that perhaps we need a bit of a spiritual pedicure. I talked to somebody between services this morning in the Connection Cafe. They mentioned they had just clipped their nails and I don't know all the rest of it, ladies, but like buffed their nails and put lotion on and I don't know what else was involved. But they said they were thinking of this verse and thinking of the, the sermon here. Beautiful feet. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel, how it has rescued us from our captivity to sin. And we pray as we consider what it means to share that gospel, to share that good news with others, that you would help us to better understand what that means, how that works, how we can be part of that in a way that brings you glory, uh, that makes a difference for the lost people that we know the people you love, and the people you have sent us to. So help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you agree that people in Bemidji who are spiritually lost need to hear the good news? Do you agree with that? Yeah, it's not a trick question. That's the starter. It's the easier question of many that I'll ask this morning. Many of us were saved at a young age. We came to Christ while we were still quite young, so it might be more difficult for us to really remember a lot of what life might have been like apart from Christ. That said, many of us can remember. We do know. We, we remember years and years of trying to live in this world without Jesus in our lives. And Colossians 3, 5 through 9 reminds Christians of what it used to be like. It says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. So not only do these verses here remind us to put these things to death because we are followers of Jesus and we can now do that through Christ, it also reminds us that those who are still spiritually lost are still being held captive. They are still in the grip of their earthly nature. You see, anyone who does not yet know Christ has not and they cannot put their earthly nature to death. They don't have the ability to do that. So they're still trapped in their sins. They are incarcerated by their sin nature. They're being held captive. Now, we used to be that too. We used to live that way and be that way. So we're not coming in any arrogance this morning. We're coming in thankfulness. And we're coming with a heart of empathy because we get it. We know we've been rescued too. So when we invite other people to be rescued, we come with a real humility and a sense of understanding. Life is just too hard without Jesus in our lives. We need to share the good news. Good news that we can be set free from captivity to sin. Good news that there is a reward of heaven awaiting those who know the Lord. Good news that tomorrow morning when you go back to school or go back to work or whatever life might be for you, that you don't have to do that alone. You don't have to face that life alone. Good news that we no longer need to navigate the troubles of this world on our own. Good news that broken relationships can be restored, can be healed, can be mended. Broken families, broken marriages, broken relationships with any number of people. Good news that we can be set free from addiction. Addiction to drugs, addiction to alcohol, addiction to some kind of sexual immorality, addiction to financial greed, whatever our addiction might be. The Lord rescues, He restores, he, he pulls us out of that, He gives us the strength and the healing from that 
pulls us out of that. Good news that there's help available for your anger problem or your lustful thoughts or your filthy language or your lying tongue. The gospel is good news that we can be rescued from these sins. Good news that we don't have to remain trapped in sin. We don't have to remain broken. We can be restored and healed through the good news about Jesus. We can find new life and hope in Jesus Christ. That's the good news. Now, none of this is to say that any of us believers have fully escaped from our earthly nature. We're still working it out. We're still being sanctified. There's a process going on. We do understand the struggle with sin because we're still struggling with our old selves to some degree. But you see, we have a certain level of relief from it. We have an ability to walk in righteousness because we're under the righteousness of Christ and we're being grown and matured in our faith, but not unbelievers. They get no relief. There is no break from this captivity day in and day out. They are held in it. They are held by it. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we have something that unbelievers don't have. Something they need, they may not even know that they need, but they need this rescue. They need the good news of the gospel. So those of us who are spiritually rich, We need to share our gospel wealth with those who are spiritually poor. Last month, I started a class on evangelism. The class is put together with a group called the Church Evangelism Institute. This class is specifically designed for lead pastors so that we can learn how to do better with our own personal evangelism. It's also designed to help lead pastors help their church to become better in evangelism, individually and as a church. It's put together by the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. First book on my reading list is a book by an author named Kevin Harney. The book is called Organic Outreach for Churches. And reading this book has forced me to ask some very difficult questions, some challenging questions And I thought, hey, I should share those with our church. So you ready for some challenging questions? I'm going to ask six questions. Is E. Free Bemidji deeply burdened and sincerely praying for the spiritually lost people in our community? Is each one of our church ministries willing to make strategic changes to improve our evangelistic impact? And are we here, the body of Christ at Ephraim Bemidji, are we loving one another well enough as a church family that non-believers long to be part of this family? Do they know we are Christians by our love? Three more. Are we willing to make sacrifices and prioritize our time and energy in order to reach the spiritually lost? Are the believers at Ephraim Bemidji eager to pursue relationships with spiritually lost people, people who are broken, people who are hurting? Is each deeply devoted follower of Jesus at Ephraim well equipped to share the good news of the gospel? And oh, how I wish that I could stand here in confidence and know with certainty that the answer to every one of these questions is a resounding yes. But I'm sorry to say that as I've prayed about my own life and I've considered the life of our church, I think a number of our answers to some of these questions, probably not yes. And certainly not a resounding yes, not a confident, bold, yes, I'm certain about that. The fact is, if our answers were that certain, if we could give a resounding yes to all six of these questions, we wouldn't need this sermon. 
we could just move on in the text. But I think our church does need this sermon. And I want to be fair. I also need this sermon. Very convicting for my own life, my own faith. It's, it's why I'm taking this class on evangelism. It's why I want to learn more and pray more. So what should we do about it? Kevin Harney gives this challenge. When a congregation is in love with itself and is committed to self-preservation, it's unlikely it will count the cost and take the steps to reach out. But when people in your church truly love others, that love drives them outward. When they love people so much that they hurt over their lost condition, they will do whatever it takes for those who love, who they love, to taste the goodness of the gospel, to experience the love of God. As the members of your church listen to the voice of Jesus saying, love your neighbor as yourself, they will be compelled to look beyond the walls of the church and the circle of their church family. Love inspired by the Spirit of God propels us out of our comfort zones and into the world. Sharing the gospel outside our walls. Now, where have I heard that before? Perhaps some of you recall that our January annual meeting, we talked about exactly that. This year, we've been prayerfully considering how can we take the gospel good news and instead of hoarding it all right here in the sanctuary, how can we spread it out to our community? How can we share that wealth with others outside these walls? So when I read this book and I read this passage, I thought, yeah, the Lord keeps bringing this to us. He's calling us to prayerfully consider what this is and what this means individually and as a church. God loves lost people. He's deeply concerned for their salvation, so deeply concerned that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him could be rescued, could be set free from sin. God is entirely vested in this salvation project. He's come for us. And there are still more who need to hear the good news. And since this is God's heart, since he is concerned for lost people, if we are deeply devoted followers of his, we should be concerned about it as well. So with all of this in mind, let's consider three ways that we can improve our evangelistic effectiveness together. First of all, we could pray. I'm not just putting that in there because I'm a pastor, because I know that sounds good. That, that's right. That is the right starting point for evangelism is prayer. Evangelism absolutely has to begin with prayer. Human hearts can't be changed any other way. It is a supernatural thing when God rescues a sinner and transforms them into a new creation. We can't do that. We can't speak well enough or behave well enough or be convincing enough. The Lord has to do that work of salvation in someone's life. So we absolutely begin with prayer. Here's three things we can pray for. We can begin by praying for a burden. For a burden for spiritually lost people. Back in Romans 9, 2, we read this a few weeks ago. I have great sorrow, unceasing anguish in my heart. Paul said that. Paul declared that for his love for the lost. But how about you and me? You feel any anguish over lost people? Any deep sorrow that they do not yet know the gospel? <clears throat> Are we in anguish over the unsaved condition of family and friends and neighbors? We also need to pray for opportunities, opportunities to share the gospel 
Romans 11, 13, and 14, Paul says, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. Now, when Paul talks about this pride here, we shouldn't think that he's talking about being prideful about our evangelism. Well, how many people have you led to the Lord this week? That's not what Paul's saying. But he is talking about taking pride in his ministry, giving it his full effort, his full attention, his energy. It's not a side issue. It's not an extra add-on. It's not a la carte if I feel a little bit like I got a little extra, maybe I'll do that. He's making it a center point of his life. And it's in the hope that some will be saved. Some of those he loves and is burdened for, that some of them will be saved. So how about you and me? Are we looking for gospel opportunities? Are we eager for them? Are we hopeful for them? Are we giving evangelism our best effort, our full attention as we follow the Lord? Ultimately, we need to pray for salvation. We want the lost to be found. Romans 10.1 says, My heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. That God would call people to himself and use us as his instruments, as his spokespeople. But how are we doing? Are we praying from a heart's desire for the lost to be found? Is it part of our prayer life? Does that desire compel us to pray regularly, fervently for salvation of lost people? There are lots of other things we can pray for and should pray for, but this one we can't miss. This needs to be at the top or near the top of our prayer list. Another way to improve our evangelistic effectiveness is to provide Bemidji with a loving, welcoming church. 99 years ago, God sent this church to this community. When we read these verses in Romans 10, verse 15 in particular, it talks about being sent. That not only applies to being sent out as individuals, but also being sent out as churches, as Christian organizations, camps and colleges and beyond. God sends organizations, and he sends the local church all over the world. And until God decides otherwise, we are here on this corner of Bemidji to be his gospel representatives. We are a lighthouse for the gospel. We're meant to be a city on the hill to proclaim so all can hear in our area. This is our responsibility Being a loving, welcoming church means that we make room for new people. I got a kick out of it this week. I was reading some of the surveys from our combined summer service, and there was one person who wrote on their survey, I came to church at 930, and somebody was sitting in my seat. And then they put a little smiley face, and they said, and I thought that was great. That is great. We want new people to feel welcomed. And if they're sitting in our chair, we'll set up another chair. We need to make room. We should be excited for that. We should hope that when we come to church, somebody took our spot. Good. I'm glad they're here. But we need to invite not just new people, but even new people who aren't exactly like us. People who might be quite different from us. Because the gospel is a gospel for all peoples. Which means that we share this place with people from different ethnicities, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, people from different political affiliations, and we could go on and on. But probably whatever makes you most comfortable, uncomfortable, those are the new people we have to be ready to love and serve and tell about Jesus. We need to strive to have a welcoming atmosphere that makes people feel wanted, people feel included. 
People not feel like outsiders, but feel like, hey, I could maybe plug in here. This could be a place. Let them know. We want them here. They're invited. We genuinely care about you. You are someone who matters to us because you're part of our community, and we would love to tell you about Jesus. Be our honor. We want people to feel like they could belong here, like this could be their home. This could become their church home. They may not have a church home at all, and we could become that kind of home for them. They might not have any kind of home. Welcoming new people requires constant diligence because our tendency is to circle up with our besties. You're probably sitting by some of your besties right now. That's okay. I sit with my besties too. Back in youth group, we used to have a rule called the horseshoe rule. No one was allowed to stand around in a circle. There's a circle. You had to open up a gap in that circle and make it look more like a horseshoe so that new people could come in to the circle. And when new people came in and closed it and made it a circle, then you had to open it again. Always thinking, always prepared for new people to join. Not a click, not a secret club, but an invite, a welcoming to whoever wants to come. So it's important that we invite people to sit with us, that we introduce them to our friends. And when we see someone standing alone or sitting alone, we go over to them. We start a conversation. Even though we're with our besties and we're having a good old time, we try to keep our eyes out and looking and finding who might it be that the Lord would have me encourage today and invite today, care about. You just never know who might walk into our church building. They might need some help. They might need some support. They might be incredibly curious Who's this Jesus? Is that what's going on here? Tell me more. Part of providing a loving, welcoming church is that those of us in this church cherish this church. Not so much the building, but the people that we cherish the people in this church. Unfortunately, though, some Christians, some believers in Christ, rather than cherishing the church, they find great satisfaction in criticizing the church. Now, to be clear, every church has its problems. E-free has its problems. If you haven't been here around here long enough to know it, we've got problems. <laughs> And we struggle sometimes, and we, we have to work through some awkward, difficult things from time to time. That's true with every church, because every church is run by imperfect people and has a bunch of sinners who've been saved by grace who still haven't figured it all out. <laughs> so that's church. And I also want to be equally clear that any church that has taken part in abuse or some other scandal should be held fully accountable, completely accountable, accountable by all the measures of Matthew 18 and the rest of Scripture, fully accountable by the laws of Minnesota and the federal government. There should be accountability for churches who mess up big time and need to get things right. So I'm not suggesting any kind of cover-up or any kind of pretending. That's not what I'm saying. What we're talking about this morning is the unfortunate reality that some believers seem to enjoy taking pot shots. It's kind of a recreational pastime. I got nothing else to do. Just like you'd be shooting cans off a fence with your BB gun. Take shots at the church. Even churches that are staying true to Christ. Even churches that are trying so hard to honor the Lord and obviously not perfect. But they really are trying to do their best. And there seem to be some who take delight in throwing stones and Delight in pointing out the flaws. Delight in slandering the local church. And it hurts. And it divides. In Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, we're reminded Christ loved the church. 
He gave himself up for the church. He gave his life for the church to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church, as a beautiful bride without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And when we attack good churches, when we belittle them and we complain about them and we tell anyone and everyone who will listen all the flaws and all the problems, we are picking on Jesus' bride. That's who we're talking about, the bride of Christ. We're damaging her reputation. Now, can you see how this might not be very attractive to unbelievers? How if unbelievers were to witness this or hear about this or be part of that, how it wouldn't really make them really want to go to church if that's what the people are like. You see, when we invite people to follow Jesus, we also invite them to become a part of the family, part of the family of God, part of a local church. In the context of Romans 10, 14, who would ever want to call on the name of the Lord and become part of a church family that spends so much of its time criticizing one another rather than cherishing one another? Who wants to be part of that? That's not very attractive. And these kind of unfortunate realities make our faith incredibly unattractive to the watching world, and they are watching, and they do hear, and they are paying attention. Once again, though, to be clear, if we've been hurt by the church, if we've been disappointed by the church, then we do need to address it. We do need to talk about that. Not deny it, not push it off, not hide it. But let's be careful how we address it and to whom we address it. Because unintentionally, we may cause an unintended consequence of driving unbelievers away from Christ. So we just want to be careful how we navigate that and what we do with that. In Romans 11, Paul says that he was motivated to share the good news with the Gentiles because he wanted to make the Jews jealous. We've talked about that a few times. What an interesting gospel strategy. I'm going to make them jealous. I'm going to preach so much and so long and so hard and so many Gentiles are going to come to faith, the Jews are just going to be like, oh, drive them crazy. Well, let's be the kind of loving welcoming church that makes our community jealous, that makes them envy whatever's going on in this building, makes them go, whoa, I want that. How do I get that? I want some of what they've got. Then we'll know that we've loved each other to the point that it makes an impact for Christ. Another way to improve our evangelistic effectiveness is to proclaim the good news with our words and actions. Once we've prayed fervently, once we've provided a loving, welcoming church family to be part of, we need to proclaim the good news. Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. One of the ways that we proclaim the gospel is through actions through good works, good deeds done in Jesus' name. And there are a number of people in our church, hundreds of people in our church, who are very good at this, loving the Lord with their actions, serving the community, glorifying God through what they do. Good deeds done in Jesus' name for the glory of God, not our glory, but His glory. Because of all that He's done for us, we're glad to bless others and use our gifts and steward all He's blessed us with so that we can bless others. It's our privilege. It's a joy. And as people watch that and see that and believe the sincerity of that, they're compelled to check out the good news. Tell me again about Jesus. All the followers of his that I keep meeting seem like really cool people. Tell me more about that. I want to know. People need to see gospel fruit lived out in our lives the way we serve in our community, the way we conduct ourselves in business, the way we handle ourselves at school, when we're out in the community and any number of other functions, 
The gospel fruit is showing, it is evident to the community. But here's the thing. People also need us to speak up. People need us to proclaim the message. Not just to live it out, but to speak it out. Not just in our actions, but in our words. Romans 10, 14 asks, how can they hear without someone preaching to them? It's good for people to see it. That underscores the truth of the message. It gives it relevancy. It gives it sincerity. But at some point, we have to say the words, declare the message of the gospel. That's our role. That's our call. In verse 14 here, that word someone, if you're wondering who that someone is, it's you. Any follower of Christ, that's you. Not just me, but it's you. Someone is you. We need to go further than simply living out the gospel with our actions. We need to proclaim it. Good news. It's meant to be announced, not hoarded, not kept quiet. Proclaimed, vocalized, out loud. Hey, I got some good news. Let me tell you about it. Not that we have to be annoying or pushy, but we can sure be excited and glad to share it. We shouldn't expect people to simply catch a hint of the gospel. I don't know if you've ever drank one of those bubbly waters and it's like a hint of lime and you're not sure that can has ever seen a lime in its life. Apparently there's some kind of lime in there, but it's clearly less than 1% lime. People need more of the gospel than a hint. They need it declared. They're not going to pick it up through some kind of osmosis. People can't hear the good news without someone preaching to them. That's what Romans 10 is telling us, without someone proclaiming it. One of the best ways to proclaim the good news to other people is to share our personal testimony. Your personal testimony is yours. It is your story, God's faithfulness in your life. Tomorrow night at the Women's Overflow event, I'm so excited to know that Kim Campbell is going to share her testimony, how God has changed her life. I hope lots of women come, and I hope you consider bringing someone who doesn't know Jesus, inviting another woman from the community, from family, friends, school, whatever it might be, to come, play some board games, see if we can beat Debbie, but more importantly, hear Kim's story, her story that she will share. You may have also noticed in the bulletin, if you look in there on November 19th, we're going to have an opportunity in our morning church services to share our testimonies with one another. We need several people who will share for a minute or two how God has changed your life. I hope you'll pray about that. Consider sharing your testimony here on November 19th. But above and beyond these kinds of opportunities, which are great in church ministry, church programs, what about our individual lives? What about our personal lives? Why not share your testimony with a spiritually lost friend this week? Why not do that? What's the worst thing that could happen? Some of you have already thought about the worst thing that could happen. It could go poorly, Pastor Jerry. It could go poorly. Maybe you'll fumble through it. Maybe you'll make a little bit of a fool of yourself. You know, the Bible actually calls us to be fools for Christ. That's a different sermon. What's the best thing that could happen? You could share the gospel with someone who really needs to hear it who needs hope, who's trapped in sin and doesn't know the way out, and they wish someone would help them know the way. They need the good news so desperately they're waiting for you. So share. Now, I know at this point there's probably a few of you who are saying, yeah, Jerry, I think I'm going to let somebody else have beautiful feet. I'm not into pedicures anyhow. And there may be some of us who are thinking, I do not have time for one more thing on my plate. My plate is full. I don't have space to put more on my plate. I'm not sure that I do either. (laughs) I'm getting nervous about this class. It's asking me for a lot. Here's the thing, though. 
This isn't necessarily adding anything to our plate. What it's doing is taking advantage of the opportunities already on our plate. People we already know, relationships we already have, people whose trust you've already earned, you're already in relationship with them. And it's sharing with them the good news, how God has helped your life. Now, if you don't have any unbelieving friends, that's a different situation. And I want to ask you to pray about one thing this week. Why not? Why don't you have any unbelieving friends? Why don't you spend any time with unbelievers? And as I'm asking that question, it's coming right back at me because I spend a lot of time with church people. But if we don't spend time with people who don't know the hope of the gospel, who's going to tell them? If it's not us. If we spend all our time with other believers, we'll never have an opportunity to share the good news with the people who need to hear it. So we need to prioritize our proximity next to those who need to hear the gospel. Prioritize our proximity next to those who need to hear the gospel. I began the sermon today the same way I will end the sermon. How are your feet looking these days? May our feet become beautiful as we share the good news with those who need to hear it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful feet of the people who came to us with the gospel. For some of us, it was a long time ago when someone first told us the good news of Jesus. And boy, are we ever glad they did. Lord, we pray that you would help us to also have beautiful feet, to declare the good news of the gospel. And we ask you, Lord, to forgive us for any apathy that we may have toward the spiritually lost. Pray that you would stir up within us a passion to share the good news. We pray for opportunities even this week. Lord, please bring people to salvation, people right here in our community. Lord, we know that you alone can change human hearts, so we pray that you would go before us. Pray that you would do your supernatural work in rescuing and redeeming the lost in our community. May we be your instruments, your faithful gospel representatives in this world. We ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.